Welcome to r slash reddit revenge. This is a story of someone getting back at someone with revenge after being wronged. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel and for so many likes. The first story. Bank paid a lot of money for repeatedly refused to acknowledge woman as a spouse or executor. The second story. Petty thief was caught and punished. On to the first story. No changes can be made without the account holder. A recent story reminded me of this act of malicious compliance by a family member. This family member's spouse passed was involved in an accident that left them critically injured. They were in ICU for months and would face permanent disability upon returning home. They didn't want to leave their home. It was close to the best hospital in the region and it was their forever home, so plans began to renovate it for accessibility. In addition to the renovations, a wheelchair van was going to be needed along with other medical equipment for home use. As she worked on all of this, it was clear that large expenditures were going to be needed and it was going to take time to draw money out of long-term savings and retirement accounts. So she called the credit card companies to get their limit increased. Sadly, before the renovations were complete, her spouse passed away after almost six months of hospitalization and therapy. Now attention turned to final arrangements. The couple had always been very frugal and maintained nearly perfect credit. All cards were being paid on time and despite carrying a balance on some cards from the construction, demolition had already started, so renovations had to continue, but at a slower pace. Money was now coming in from those long-term savings. The problem is one major credit card company refused to work with her. She tried to access the account and was told, sorry, I have to speak to the account holder. She explained that her spouse had passed away and she was wanting to pay what was left on the card. She also explained that she was an account holder. Evil Bank stated that she was not on the account she was a mere cardholder and she had no rights to the account. The person on the phone explained that her husband opened the account without her and just gave her the card. She just didn't understand how credit cards work. This was a lie. The couple had always been joint account holders on everything since they were first married for exactly this reason. They had done extensive estate planning and made sure that all their assets were protected in trusts, should the worst occur. They knew their kids would be cared for and their partner would be able to access everything. Also, she ran the couple's business for over a decade navigating a sea of regulations, insurance company billing, and payroll, finances, and taxes. Needless to say, she did not enjoy being condescended to. Unfortunately, Evil Bank would not budge. They would not allow any access to the account for any reason, but for some reason they didn't cancel the card after finding out the sole account holder had passed away. This back and forth went on for weeks with multiple calls to the Evil Bank and trying to escalate the issue to supervisors to address the state of the account. In a final attempt to show Evil Bank that they were hurting themselves by this, so, I'm unable to access any part of the account even to make a payment? Evil Bank, that's right. So, the account is going to be closed? Evil Bank, no, only the account holder can do that. Even though the account holder is dead? Evil Bank, only the account holder, ma'am. So, what does that mean for card holders and being able to charge on the account? Evil Bank, only the account holder can deactivate a card or modify the account. So, what happens if a card holder uses their card? Evil Bank, they can continue to use the card until the account holder tells us otherwise. The deceased account holder, Evil Bank. Yes, I can't help you with anything else. You need to put the account holder on the phone if you want to change anything or make a payment. No, that's fine. She broke down crying immediately after, but decided that they set the rules, so she would play by them. All the final expenses, medical bills, and as much construction cost as possible would put onto that credit card. She maxed it out and then let it sit until the credit card company started calling for payment. I'm sorry, per your policy, I'm just the cardholder and I'm not responsible for any balance. Ma'am, this balance needs to be paid or it will affect your credit. It better not. I'm not on the account. This is an illegal collections call and I will be reporting it to the FTC and the attorneys general in your home state and mine. I still have his number on speed dial. You can make your case to the court. She was used to getting medical insurance companies to pay claims for the last decade or so. You didn't want to play hardball with her. Remember how all the assets were in trusts? On paper, her partner had no assets to place a lien on. All the cash in the joint checking account had been used to pay expenses for the last several months, and withdrawals from long-term savings were sent to her account, not the joint account. They had agreed to move all exposed assets shortly after her partner regained consciousness, fearing the worst. Plus, all the income from the business had been brought home in her name for more than a decade, so she would actually get some kind of social security payment when she got older. So not only did his estate have no assets to go after, he didn't have an income for the last decade. Evil Bank was left with a maxed out credit card and no assets in the estate they could file against for payment. The handful of other credit card companies worked with her to raise limits temporarily or remove daily spending caps for large expenditures. 
and they were all paid without a single missed, later partial payment. Evil Bank had to eat a five-figure loss, all because they decided that the wife didn't deserve to be on the account from day one. She had every intention to pay every bill and expense. She's never been one to try to scam or cheat someone. She gave Evil Bank every chance to accept money for the bill. They repeatedly refused to acknowledge her as a spouse or executor, but she sure liked the irony of the only company that refused to acknowledge the death of her spouse ended up paying for the funeral expenses. And the second story is when service personnel screw the pooch. Here's a story for you. I served from 2009 to 2016 in the US Navy, originally slated as a nuclear machinist maid. Location names will be used except for private businesses and people who work at the same, but if you're familiar with the area, you should know what's going on. One weekend in November 09, I was wrapping up my A school, the first school that we had to go through to get qualified as Navy nuclear operators. My classmates and I didn't feel like spending the whole weekend on base studying, so we went off base to the local mall and shopping center. I was perusing the local tabletop game store, the Dragon's Roost, first name change, and I was intrigued by all the Warhammer 40,000 models on display. Most of it was artfully painted and placed on display for people to see what can be done with the hobby. I came across one diorama with a bunch of space marines duking it out with a squad of tyranids. All the marines had names associated with them, on flags flying for each, with people related to the store on the space marine side. US Navy, US Army, or good customer insert name here. The space marines I could recognize as Brother Steve, the store owner name changed, and Brother Shannon, his wife, name also changed. However, my eye was caught by one space marine, bolter pistol a foot away by scale, from his outstretched hand lying on the ground with a clean hole through his chest. His flag read Brother Shoplifter. There had to be a story behind this. I asked Steve about it, and with it being a slow Saturday, lucky us, he launched into his tale. OP's note, I'll be shifting to his perspective, as Steve told me the story. Back in the 90s, we were having a bumper day. I was ringing up customers nonstop. We had a bunch of off-duty sailors, airmen, and marines playing tabletop games on the side room, and my wife was generally wandering to make sure everyone was satisfied given the day's chaos. I don't see Shannon stop in the breezeway between the rooms, putting her hands on her hips. One of the Marines did. Marine asked, what's going on, Shannon? She had started glaring at one kid, a fresh out of boot airman, with a sweatshirt on, going up and down the comic book aisles, grabbing stuff and not putting everything back. She simply responded, I think that man is stealing. All the players got up from that table and went to cover the doors. Two flanked Shannon, one to the back, two to the front, and one to either side of the aisle the booty was in. The two covering the aisle were both Marines built like a brick outhouse. They approach the kid and ask what he has under his sweater. The kid responds, nothing. Nothing, huh? An open palm punch flies out and hits the kid square in the chest, his arms flying out to either side of him to maintain balance, and comics drop out of the front of his sweatshirt all over the floor. Nothing, huh? Then loudly, that looks like about 500 bucks worth of stolen goods. Hey Steve, isn't that grand larceny? I started reeling a bit, but come to my senses and say, yeah, it is. Then the Marines both grab the kid and start hauling him out the front door towards one of the sailor's Camaros to shove him into the back and take him back to base. I figured they had it well in hand. Meanwhile, a shipyard bubba with his son in tow comes in and asks me what's going on. I told him it was the shoplifter and the servicemen had it under control. Shouldn't you call the cops, he asks? Huh, yeah, I should. I step out front and call out to the group. Hey guys, we have a witness. The Marines, who were having difficulty shoving the airmen into the non-existent back seat of this Camaro, pause and look at each other and the sailor, then haul the kid back inside and plop him down between a couple of the display cases and stare the kid down, daring him to make a move while I call the Charleston police. Within 10 minutes, a cop black as night and roughly 7 feet tall arrives to take charge. He's so tall, he has to duck under the doorframe to get in. He then asks me if I was the owner or the manager of the establishment. I responded, I'm the owner. The cop takes one look at the kid, now white as a sheet and asks me, what do you want me to do to him? Not with, too. Charleston police will bend over backwards to please owners of any building or establishment they get called to, but don't give a hoot about managers or renters, this being the South. It's a very Southern US thing. I just told the cop to take the kid back to whatever base he's from, they'll deal with him there. To my surprise, the cop is back within 20 minutes and told me that the kid was just going to get a slap on the wrist based on the reception he received. I wouldn't have that, so I called up one of my friends on the base, a Chief Master Sergeant, call him Chief, an E-9 in the Air Force, and the first sergeant of the base at the time. I gave him the whole spiel, and he told me he'll take care of it. We kept tabs through the kid's ordeal, where I found out he was put on extra latrine duties on his side of the runway, and then immediately moved over to the other side of the runway to do more of the same for the landing planes in their lavatories. This had gone on for a good three months, when his captain, Air Force 03, took notice and put in immediate transfer papers 
seeing as the kid obviously peeved off one of his seniors and was getting hammered for it. As it turned out, all transfer papers crossed the first sergeant's desk for signing off and adjustments, up to and including recommending rerouting. He recommended Nome, Alaska as the kid's next duty post. OP's note, the Nome base hadn't been in use since the mid-1950s by the Air Force, so I'm pretty sure Steve had that one mixed up with one of the other Alaskan bases, but the point was still valid. He called me to tell me what was up with Brother Shoplifter, and I figured that him getting transferred out would be the end of it. Chief, no way, I'm not done with him yet. After another week, the chief called me and told me what was done. The conversation went roughly like this. Gnome's reception. Gnome Air Force Base, this is Airman, redacted speaking. You're on an unsecured line. How may I help you, sir or ma'am? Chief, hi, this is Chief Master Sergeant Redacted, first sergeant at Charleston Air Force Base. I'd like to speak with my equivalent there on your base regarding a personnel transfer. Airman, wait one, Chief, sure? Five minutes later, Hello, this is Technical Sergeant Redacted speaking. We don't have a first here, but I'm the ranking enlisted. What's up, Chief? Chief, I have a fresh transfer here going up to Alaska for a change in scenery. You should be seeing his papers coming through pretty soon, but I need to talk to you regarding the reasons as to why he's being sent out of rotation. Tech, I have a new airman coming up from your neck of the woods. Name of Airman Brother Shoplifter, but nothing stating as to why. Chief, that's him. This isn't someone trying to escape their Dependa, is it? Chief, no, this is someone who got caught up in a legal issue. The other party declined to press charges, so he has no local police record, but I wanted to let you know that he got caught shoplifting at one of our local businesses, a comic store by the name of the Dragon's Roost. Tech, wait a minute, he stole from Steve? Once Steve finished telling us this, Jim, I and my buddies just started howling with laughter. We immediately took the lesson here to heart, in that the military is a very tight-knit community, the Navy nuclear community even more so, as our instructors had told us. I also bought a set of dice that I still use to this day. It still amazes me how many people would rather double down than admit fault. In the nuclear navy, the nuclear reactor operators, this would be considered an integrity violation and get you kicked out of the navy pretty quickly. I don't play. I am, however, quite observant and keep my fingers on the pulse of many of the current nerd hobbies, despite sticking with tabletop RPGs. In all honesty, Steve lost track for the most part, save the occasional yep his life still sucks update from Chief. He said as much, and back then, they were much harder on signing that four-year contract when you joined the service. As the booty didn't get a legal record in Chucktown, for all intents and purposes he was just a screw-up, as opposed to a criminal. I hope you guys love these stories. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to know when the new video comes out.